Hello, everyone, and welcome to the information session today. My name is Charles Moore, and I am the director of the Executive MBA Americas program. I will be introducing the National MBA, Executive MBA program and the Americas program today. Uh, and I'm joined by uh, a great alumni panel uh, who will be able to help add more uh, personal information, anecdotes, and uh, answer your questions about the programs. We're joined today by Jeff and Monica. And I'd like to just turn it over to you for a moment to introduce yourself. So let's start with Jeff and then Monica. Morning, thanks, Charles. Uh, Jeff Chang, uh, calling from Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. I'm an alumni of the EMBA America's Class of 2019, and I work uh, for Ethical Bean Coffee, available at your local Sobe store for a bargain of twelve dollars. That's great, Jeff. Is it uh, available at any other outlets as well? Online as well as Costco in Western Canada. Okay, very good. Well, I just wanted to give Jeff a chance to promote his product, of course. Uh, Thickle Bean Coffee is a great coffee. Uh, Monica, how about over to you? Thanks, Charles. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Monica Deer. I graduated from the program earlier this year. Um, I'm with Health Canada. I've had quite the career. Started um, with the state attorney's office in the U.S. and then here in Canada with um, Health Canada as a policy analyst. That's great, Monica. How long have you been with Health Canada? It's been obviously a very busy, busy period over the last few years. Charles, I've been with the department, I want to say almost 19 years in different wow. capacities and across the country in Vancouver, um, Edmonton, and, and took a couple of short um, opportunities to work with the Canadian Standards Association and do some other things in the U.S. and but still remained with the department in some capacity. That's amazing. Great. So a lot of a deep wealth of experience in government, that's for sure. Well, thanks for joining today. Uh, my name is Charles Moore. I've, I've been the director of the Americas program for about five years. And uh, prior to that, I worked uh, with uh, a private equity group and we uh, purchased and uh, partnered with universities around North America. Um, so I have a long uh, history in education. I'm happy to answer any questions that come up about um, education, even beyond our program. So just reach out to me after after this um, this session, and I'd be happy to meet with you and to discuss uh, anything that you have on your mind. Uh, but for today, let's let's get through go through the slides and uh, learn a little bit more about these programs. Uh, as we go through uh, the, the presentation, please feel free to put your questions into the Q&A. Um, and our uh, colleague, Alex Mundy, is on the call, and she'll try to answer them for you as they come in. If there's something that uh, we want to ask to the panel or to me, then we'll just, Alex will leave it in the Q&A and we'll get to that question as we go through. But uh, to begin this session, we want to think a little bit about motivation. So uh, I'm asking you on the, in the audience to think about why are you here and why do you want to learn about an executive MBA? And now I'm going to ask Jeff and Monica to go back in time to try to think about what, why you pursued an executive MBA. And let's start with Monica this time. Do you remember when you first started to seek out information about an executive MBA? What were you uh, trying to accomplish and what were you trying to learn? I do, Charles. You know, for me, it started maybe, I want to say, five years ago, where I started to think, you know, moving into sort of the next level of my career I think I do want an MBA, but it wasn't until the pandemic and there was so much work in the department. Um, and it's amazing. I took on some extra work and realized that I have this capacity and now I need to do something else with this and do something more. And that's exactly what I did, decided to do the MBA. That's amazing. I think it's definitely more productive than learning how to make sourdough bread. So that's a great use of your time. Way to go, Monica. <laughs> how about you, Jeff? Why, what were you thinking about when you were uh, first pursuing this, this uh, venture? I think like most people, I was looking to broaden my understanding of general business. I, I kind of worked my career through sales and marketing. And I've always had general interest and knowledge in expanding um, kind of the opportunities. And I think the EMBA or an MBA is or at first was what I was considering was kind of that golden uh, idea or the, the peak performance of where I wanted to get to, um, to take the next step in my career. Great. So what I'm hearing is kind of personal development and career advancement. And if we go to the next slide, I have some data. Um, you can actually see here that about 40 
percent of the people who are pursuing an executive MBA are really looking to advance their career. About 40% are thinking about switching their career and about 20% are interested in entrepreneurship. And so I'm sure that that uh, both of you are falling into these, these buckets, uh, but this is by, by and large uh, who you will meet in the program, who will be joining the program and what their motivations are. It changes a little bit from year to year, but in general, it's these three uh, primary motivations that you will see. Um, every year we have a group of people who uh, leave the program starting businesses or side hustles, uh, but more commonly we see people um, advancing their careers or switching their careers. And in fact, I'll, I'll have a take a moment to put a plug in. We had some really exceptional results from the Financial Times rankings this year. Uh, both of our programs, I believe, are ranked number 11 in the world for career progression, which is a pretty remarkable uh, achievement for, for these Canadian programs. So I would encourage you to go and take a look at the Financial Times rankings and uh, learn more about, um, about those. If you have any questions specifically about that, we'd be happy to answer more information uh, as well. Uh, in general, uh, executive MBA programs have the core MBA curriculum that everybody would anticipate, such as uh, marketing courses, finance courses, HR courses, leadership courses. But I don't really want to delve too deeply into the curriculum because really, in order to graduate with an MBA, you're going to be taking many of the same courses in a lot of different schools. I'm happy to go into more detail about our curriculum if you want to have that conversation offline. But today, I'd really prefer to talk more about what makes our program different and unique. And when I look at, uh, at the overview of the program, I always ask questions of the students five or six years after they've graduated from the program, what they remember the most about the program. And it's usually team-based learning. So I'm gonna start there. Uh, Jeff, I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about your team and how it formed and what your experience was with working with the team. Yeah, um, we had a very, very diverse group of people in our boardroom. Uh, we had a larger group of nine who uh, managed to kind of come together throughout the program. Um, what was really great about this experience for us is that the way the program is set up, each individual that applies or gets into the program per boardroom is set with their career and skills. And so you can lean on each other to help develop your own skills and improve your own um, uh, knowledge and understanding uh, with your teammates as you're going through. So you not only do you gain that knowledge from the school and the, the way that the program is set up, but you get it through your own group uh, as well. well. That's great. And Monica, um, could you tell me a little bit about your team and how it formed? So I think I really lucked out. Um, in Ottawa, the team was seven of us and I called us the group of seven. Um, like Jeff, a very diverse group of people, wonderful people. Um, we still connect to this day. And what was really interesting about our group was um, they were all very strong in personality and already leaders. So we were just developing as we were going. And the nicest thing about it was that we were developing each other in a sense. Um, there were obviously the program's not easy and life is not easy. So there were issues along the way but these are people we could turn to, to really help out, deal with, with the program, deal with situations in life. And, and like I said, we still connect today. That's amazing, that's great. You may wonder in the audience why we have a team-based approach to, the, to, the, uh, to an executive MBA. And that's because of the feedback we receive from our advisory boards and our alumni. Again and again, they're telling us that they're really looking for people who can be a leader on one project, who could be an individual contributor on another, and who could also just be a subject matter expert on a third project. And the companies today really want to have this dynamic uh, situation where you can react quickly to, to whatever comes your way. And that's why we've really focused in on the team-based uh, aspect of the program. So I want to just be completely transparent. This is a truly a team-based program. You cannot graduate this program without being on the team. About 50% of your grades will come from your teamwork. And we have a lot of infrastructure around how the teams work. So there, there is a process in place. You'll take different roles as you go through uh, projects. You would debrief them after you go through the project to see if you can improve um, your, your uh, process or to improve how the team can operate. And the goal is at the end to, to have the high performing team, to really give you an example of what it's like to work in a high performing team. And that, that uh, word is very specific and very meaningful. And the reason I highlight it right now is because uh, sometimes I receive the question, why do we stay, why do the students stay in the team 
for 17 or 18 months? Why don't they change so frequently? And the reason that we really want to, to put them into, into that kind of uh, experience is so that they have time to work through those difficulties and those challenges. And it happens to every team. Uh, there's the, maybe people on the call have heard of the, of the terms of um, storming, norming, performing, high performing. That's a fairly common uh, four, four words uh, about how teams are built. And we found that if, if you're constantly changing the teams, you're always in that kind of storming phase or maybe performing, maybe you just cut some people out and you go and, and do it uh, and you do two or three people do the work. But that's really not what we want to accomplish. We want, we want you to be able to work on a team where uh, you're able to accomplish more than the individual full-time equivalents. Um, so I know people are often nervous about how, how they're going to get along with their teammates and how they're going to form into those relationships. So I'm going to ask uh, both Monica and Jeff a little bit about how you got to know your teammates and how you got over that first, that first bump uh, when you first started to work together and you're wondering who's going to be the leader, who's going who's gonna to do all the extra work, who's going to do the editing, who's going to do the presenting, all those typical um, uh, concerns that you have. So let's start with you, Monica. Do you have any, uh, any anecdotes about how your team formed into that uh, positive uh, group? I do. Um, Charles, again, I, I think I lucked out with the really good team. I don't know if it also happens to do that, you know, we're, we're in the capital city, so we are very diplomatic and, and, you know, we were good. We understood very quickly, um, you know, the different personalities, or at least I did. And I think some of the others did as well. And it was interesting. There were a couple of leaders, there were alpha dogs and, <laughs> ironically I was one of them <laughs> and and that was my learning was you know learn when to pause and and learn from others and and we were able as a group to learn I think about ourselves and each other and that was extremely helpful um and we had an opportunity then to work on with other teams and to your point we never got to the norming stage <laughs> so there was the storming and the forming and, and never really norming. But um, for the most part, my my home team, we, we had the time to really understand each other's strengths. And we played at the, we played on those. And then there were times when we would encourage each other to just, you know, do the piece that we weren't comfortable doing and we would support each other. We all took turns. Um, and that's the pro program is set up that way where there's different leaders at different times, but um, it, it's interesting. We were able really and truly to learn, you know, who can do what, when. That's great. And Jeff, how about you? Was there any, were there any moments where you felt uncomfortable in the team? Yeah, there's always those times. Uh, and I think it's usually at the start of the program when everybody's trying to feel each other out. And maybe it was a little bit of my own ego and not letting that go uh, quite early or as early as I think I could have and, and achieved that high performance sooner. The school does a really good job of giving you the tools, resources, and coaching to, um, to actually create that high performance team. And at the time that I did it, they were, you know, they've been doing this for over 10 years. And the sooner you let your ego go to follow that process, the sooner and faster you'll be able to create that high performance team. And I always laugh and I always kind of thought that it would be fun if they did this. The first uh, group project you do is creating a mission and value statement as a group. And when you have several hands in the pod, it can take hilariously several hours to come up with just a few sentences. And I would have laughed to have seen what that might have looked like if we had done it after the 18 months, probably 20 minutes and we would have signed off and been out uh, enjoying ourselves. But it took that long or you know, it takes a few months and a few projects and some learning to really uh, get to the point where the school can get you to. That's great. That's that's excellent. I'm well. I'm glad you enjoyed and benefited the the team aspect of it. And I think it really is the core, unique aspect of our program. So we have a lot of ways to support uh, the team based mission. And and if we look at the uh, way it's delivered, I'm just trying to click forward here to the boredom environment. Um, this is this is the 
sorry, I've gone ahead two slides. This is how we deliver the program during the video conferencing sessions. So we have these studios um, in, uh, in, in Kingston and in, at Cornell for the Americas program. And our professors will uh, teach in front of a green screen and they'll, they'll be presenting the courses. And then the, the broadcast goes directly to our boardroom locations. We have boardrooms all across Canada in Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Markham, Mississauga, Toronto, uh, Montreal, and Ottawa as well as we have remote teams where people can join this, this uh, uh, broadcast on the Saturday and Sunday, the America's programs, and on Friday and Saturday in the national program. So the students are sitting in their boardrooms, participating in the courses. You can kind of see on the image here, there's a Calgary C in the middle. That's really what we see from the studio, and that's what it looks like when, the, when they're participating. All of these, uh, these boardroom sessions are then um, uh, delivered on the weekends, and then three or four times per year, depending on the program, there's live residential sessions where you can deepen your personal relationships. But uh, it really is an interesting way to deliver the program. What we hear often, especially during the COVID period, is a lot of people would do online learning or they were joining through, um, they were joining programs uh, through their computer at home. But one of, the, one of the downsides of that type of learning is there's less peer pressure. So we really do encourage you to get into the boardrooms, to participate with your friends. And there is that kind of positive environment that you, that you feel when you're in, your, in a, an office with people around you. And there's a bit of peer pressure to perform when you have people sitting beside each other as well. Um, I have some just, some just straight questions. Uh, Jeff, I, I know that you did it. You did the program before COVID, so you were definitely in the boardroom environment. Were there any concerns about the technology? Because that was a concern that, that students used to have with how the technology would work. Pre-COVID, this was a question that probably came up more than it will now uh, to say how seamless that this learning environment is. Uh, we never had any leg. We never had any downtime. Uh, there was never uh, a challenge in understanding uh, how to operate the tools. It's very, very simple. I always kind of joke that it's like the Star Trek environment where you have multiple screens and you can see the professor is active and that they're able to call you in. They don't quite show it here, but they'll have the biographies of people um, and resumes of people in the boardroom. So you're very engaged. Um, but, you know, in the new COVID world, the technology, you know, it's almost now totally expected, but but in my time we were, you know, it was revolutionary and, and still quite is. Yeah, that's great. And Monica, you were doing the program during COVID. And did you have any issues with connecting? Because it's uh, probably top of mind as well for everybody. What happens if, if another COVID surge comes back? What are we going to do? So maybe you could tell us a little bit about your experience. The experience was good. You know, we were interactive. We were able um, to really be engaged. All the learning was very good. The only issues I think were, you know, you're working during the day. So that, you know, the work-life balance, you go from work and then, you know, you're still in your seat and you go into the programs. Um, and I think that's a challenge, you know, for me at least during, during the pandemic, um, it was just the Zoom fatigue. But we learned how to get around things when you needed a bit of a break and not to be on screen. So we figured it out. And then we did have a few times where we met um, the, the whole cohort, which was really great. We went on campus um, at least a few times. And our team, we, we met maybe once or twice. Okay. And that was also really great. Oh, good. So we just to confirm, we are intending to go back to the regular schedule for next year. We have all of our boardrooms open again. So uh, Monica's experience is a little bit different from what we will be delivering uh, next year. Uh, but it's important to hear Monica's experience because if we do have another pandemic or we, we do have another surge of cases, we will be able to switch instantly to that model. So we can we, we never have to worry about downtime or losing, losing uh, time uh, towards graduation as you go through the program. One of the reasons why students do an executive MBA in particular is to really build that alumni network and uh, to make connections and to meet people. And I know that one of the concerns people have is if they're doing this through uh, periodic residential sessions and uh, video conferencing sessions, are they gonna be able to actually make deep and meaningful relationships with, uh, with everybody? And so I like to describe this as kind of a series of concentric circles. If you can think of dropping a stone in a pond and it starts to ripple, I see that first ripple of being, you know, your teammates in your in your Ottawa or in Vancouver. 
you're going to get to know them probably more than you want to know them at the beginning of the program. They're going to be like brothers and sisters or cousins, and you're going to know them very well. But then there's the next round is kind of the people that are in your section and the people that you see through video conferencing. And then there's another circle where you start to meet them um, in residential sessions or in the on-site sessions, and you start to get to know each other in, in a more meaningful and deep way. And then finally, there's the alumni network that's so, so tremendous. But what I would really like to hear from both of you is uh, about how you build those relationships and how do you maintain them and how do they develop? And maybe we can start with Jeff this time because I'm, I'm trying to rotate. So please don't be offended, Monica and Jeff, if I get out of rotation. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, one of the things I look at this slide here, it says a powerful network for life. And it did. there's a ripple effect in that too. We had a very large group and we celebrated, we're very social as well, we celebrate each and every milestone, whether it be a midterm exam or even just a quiz. And often the friends and family um, also enjoyed, uh, you know, participated in those events after our classes. But we, the nice thing is we had all these boardrooms across the country. And I can't think of, when I think of Calgary or I think of Houston, I can't think of the people, uh, with, I can't think of the city without thinking of the people that were in those boardrooms. We graduated almost, you know, three and a half years ago, and a bunch of us are going to Seattle uh, in the next few weeks for a mini reunion after kind of the pandemic. We text every day. We saw 100 text messages in our cohort of uh, kids in Halloween costumes. We celebrate all the milestones of birth and marriage and, and things like that. So these people, you get to know them. You're spending, you know, up to 20 hours a week with them at times. Uh, and they're struggling, you know, the same way that you are. And so you get, you'll be able to bond over that. Amazing. How about you, Monica? Do you have any uh, feedback about the network? Absolutely. Um, I think it's a big part of the program and it's an important part, but it takes time and you have to find that time. Um, and what some of us did was, was just two book coffee chats with each other, like tops five to 15 minutes just to meet people. The cohort's large. Um, you're not gonna meet everybody, but you have to make that effort. I do think it pays off. It's interesting, after I graduated, I was um, curious about a position and I just reached out to some alumni in a different cohort um, just to get some information and this person responded right away. I think it's, very interesting, and I think a lot of people understand this as alumni to support each other. That's because great. essentially you're supporting your asset, which is, you know, graduating from this program. That's excellent. That's excellent. I, there's, that's a great idea about having the coffee chats and getting to know each other in that way. It reminds me of one student uh, who was who graduated last year, and he told me that um, at the end of them, I said, how did, you know, at the end of the program, I said, how did it go? How do you feel about building relationships? Did you were able to do that? And he was so proud because it was in the final residential session and he had a list of all of the students in the program and he was intending to spend five minutes with each of them deliberately at some point during a res a, an on-site session where they could sit down, have a coffee, just ask a few questions. And he was so proud that he made it through 152 or 153 five minute meetings. I thought that was, that was amazing. I thought that's a really systematic approach <laughs> to building, to building relationships. But I have to say it worked. I mean, everybody knew who he was and everybody knew uh, what his goals were and, uh, and uh, what a great way to do it. So um, there's a, there's a tip for you out there Two Two great ideas about how to build your network when you, when you get into the program. I'll go now into some details about each uh, program, and then we'll get back to the questions to the alumni. So the national program is 16 months long. You can take it from anywhere in Canada, um, and there's three on-campus sessions. Um, we have great uh, project courses in this course and the America's program, which are really great ways to, to advance your career. If you, if you really are interested in advancing your career, you can dedicate those projects, uh, your individual projects specifically, to trying to stretch yourself and to move into a new career goal. The national program begins in August, and then there are classes all day Friday, half day Saturday. So just I'm going to repeat that all day Friday, half day Saturday. And I'm repeating that because it's different from other programs. Uh, there's another residential session in February. And then in October, the team or the group goes overseas on an overseas study group. Monica, did you get a chance to do that when you traveled in the program? Or was that uh, the year that it was canceled? Um, for us, it wasn't canceled for um, Barcelona. Okay. So Spain, but I was part of the Singapore 
group and that was not a go for us. Okay. Well, un unfortunately, yeah, for you, that's that's too bad. But this year they did. They did go to Singapore. Gloria just came back from Singapore, who's the director of the Americas program. Uh, and that course, I think in that, that year, Monica, there are many people who really enjoyed going to Spain. I, I remember seeing lots of photos about that. And those are great opportunities to go there and to learn about uh, doing business in the European Union or in Asia uh, with, with one of our great partners. We have over 100 international um, university partners and, and their top schools all around the world. Uh, so again, this program is delivered through three residential sessions, as well as the video conferencing weekends, which are all day Friday and half day Saturday. Uh, the Americas program is a dual degree program between Queen's and Cornell University, and I highlight that term dual degree because it has a specific meaning. It means when you graduate from the program, you graduate with both a Cornell degree and a Queen's degree. So you'll get two diplomas and two pieces of paper. And I often get questions about this, Jeff, is that really true? Do we really graduate from Cornell? So I'm just going to ask you directly, Jeff, did you graduate from Cornell? I sure did. Uh, okay. The day after I graduated from Queen's, we yeah, packed into the car and drove <laughs> down. <laughs> That's great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for confirming that, Jeff. But you do have um, two transcripts, two university records, and you have the services of two universities as well. Our program is uh, located in Canada, but also the United States, Chile, Mexico, and Peru. Um, and we have about 160 students in our program every year. <clears throat> this program begins in June, and we will start in, at Cornell. We spend a week down there, and then we come up to Kingston for a week. And then we do our, our video conferencing uh, classes all day Saturday uh, on, and half day Sunday. So all day Saturday, half day Sunday. It's a, it's a slight difference between the two programs. Uh, in December, we go to Toronto to do a session on new venture management. Uh, in fact, we have Raptors tickets uh, this year. So Jeff, if you are, or Monica, if you are uh, in town on the 5th, I can take you to the Celtics Raptors game with our cohort if you're around. Uh, it should be lots of fun. And we do that session there in December. Then there's a bit of a break, and then we do more video conferencing before in April we go to New York City, where the Cornell, Cornell has a university campus there called Cornell Tech, and we go there for uh, a week. And then finally in November we come back to Kingston and Ithaca, uh, and in fact we're going to begin our residential session on Friday, our on-site session on Friday with students arriving uh, in, in Kingston. So our programs are uh, about $103,000 for the national program, and it's about $153,000 for the Americas program. So I say about because they may change a little bit for the fees of next year as we go through the process of budgeting. Um, I wouldn't anticipate much of a change. Uh, the only risk to the change in the price for the Americas program is the a portion of those fees are paid in US dollars. So there is currency risk that changes uh, the prices uh, periodically. Uh, students finance these programs through a number of ways, but the most popular way is through a line of credit from one of the major banks. We highlight RBC here because they know us very well, uh, but certainly any of, the, any of the big banks in Canada or credit unions would have this kind of professional line of credit that's available. You, can, you should tell them about the program and about the university because there are slightly different um, payment terms and uh, interest rates depending on the university uh, that you're going to study through. Uh, you can borrow from your RRSP twice. These are full-time programs. You will get a form called a T2202A, which is a, a tax credit form uh, that you can use for some tax planning. About 35% of our students have some type of corporate sponsorship as well. Um, so just so you know, that's typically not full sponsorship, but that could be some, some, uh, some type of sponsorship, including additional holidays for a couple of years while you go through the program. We would encourage you to uh, to communicate with Alex and to think about the um, your approach to the companies. And we would always always advise you to tell the companies that you're doing the the program and that you're going into the program. And even if they don't um, if they don't uh, uh, provide some kind of sponsorship, it's a good way to start having that conversation about how you are investing in yourself and you're developing your career. And they should be start they should start thinking about how you're going to move up within their their companies or their offers. It's a it's a a good um, I would say, uh, leverage point for you to discuss your future career development with that company. Uh, if you're going to invest all of this time and money into your own development, they should be uh, clearing a path for you to help them. Uh, and then the scholarship opportunities exist as well. We have a few scholarship opportunities. One is for uh, women. It's called the 30% the Club, and it's a 50% scholarship, which is an amazing scholarship opportunity. We award that every year to one uh, qualified uh, female candidate in both of the programs. 
We also have a black a scholarship for black students, and it's uh, specifically targeted to uh, help them uh, help a black student to achieve their goals. And we have one for indigenous students as well. So if there's a student uh, out there who would like to apply for those scholarships, there's specific deadlines along the way, and Alex will be able to give you more specific information as you go through the process. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Alex just for a couple of minutes to talk through the application process. Hi everyone, so as Charles mentioned, my name is Alex Mundy and I am an application advisor for both uh, the executive MBA programs, so both the National and the Americas programs. Uh, and so really uh, throughout the application process, you would work with me uh, to complete your application file. So there's a few steps that you would need to take to complete your file. And so we'll start with the preliminary assessment, as you can see on the slide. Um, so really, that's the, the very beginning of the process. That's when you get a chance to, to chat with me a little bit about what you're hoping to get out of an MBA program. I'm here to help you find the best fit as well. So um, whether that be the National or the Americas program, um, really at the preliminary stage, what we want to see is uh, we're looking for students who have um, some sort of management experience, leadership experience. And we've heard Jeff and Monica talk a little bit about that in their teams as well. Um, just sort of the alpha type or that leader leadership experience as well. Um, and it's a what, what we want to see is typically about eight to 10 years of work experience at a minimum uh, with a, a few years in, in project or people management experience. And so that can look very different, of course, depending on what industry you're coming from. But that's sort of the, the starting uh, point of the process is, is just getting a sense of what, what's going to be the best fit for you. Um, so at that beginning stage, we want to see a resume, we want to see some of your academic transcripts as well coming through. Um, and then to complete your file, once we um, move forward with the application process, um, it's a simple process. Really what we're looking for is, is three elements. So uh, we want to see some references. So we want to see current references, typically a, a current colleague and a current superior. Uh, we'd like you to complete some application questions. So that's those essay questions listed there. That's sort of like your cover letter. And then lastly, um, any official transcripts coming from your post-secondary uh, institution. And I should say, when it comes to those requirements um, for the Executive MBA National Program, we do invite students who maybe didn't complete an undergraduate degree at, at the university level to still put forward an application for that program. We don't need to see an, an undergraduate degree. Um, we recognize that there's lots of ways for students to advance within their career. Um, and so in that case, we might ask you for a, a fourth uh, or, sorry, element of your application, and that's the executive assessment. So you can see that at the bottom of the requirements tab there. Um, an executive assessment is essentially a, a very condensed version of the GMAT. It's made by the same creators of the GMAT. Um, and so I would walk you through that process of what that looks like, but that could be required for the Executive MBA National Program as well. Uh, in the Executive MBA Americas Program, we do ask to see an undergraduate degree um, for your application. And so really, once your file is complete, that's when we would uh, schedule an interview with our program director. So Charles for the Americas Program, our director Gloria for the National Program. Um, and then at that stage, you would receive an admission decision typically within a few weeks of that interview after um, your file goes for a final review uh, from both the both admissions committees at Cornell and Queens or just Queens, depending on which program you're, you're applying for. Um, so in terms of timelines, Charles mentioned um, with the scholarships that we do have some deadlines to keep in mind. In general, we are a rolling admissions program, so we will continue to accept students until our cohort is full. Um, that can depend on which boardroom you're interested in, as some boardrooms do tend to fill up more quickly than others. So again, that's something we can chat one-to-one uh, -one about. Um, but in terms of scholarship opportunities, those are specifically for students to apply for once they're enrolled in the program. Uh, and so for the Americas program, we do have a deadline uh, in March uh, to apply for those scholarships so mid-March. Again, that means that you'd want to start your application much sooner than that date so that you would be eligible to apply for those scholarships. And in the national program, it's a little bit later, it's in the spring, um, that you would have a deadline to apply for those scholarships. So a few deadlines to keep in mind, but that's again, something we can chat about one-to-one. Um,
Great, and thanks, thanks, Alex. And Alex will be following up uh, with an email after the webinar. So if you have any questions, you can always uh, reply to that email and make contact with her, and she'll be happy to help you out. So let's go back to the panel and let's ask some questions. I see there's one question in the Q and A, but uh, I would invite everybody now to put the um, put their questions into the Q and A to the to the panel, and we can ask them anything that you have. I'm checking here. Okay, Danny Cluche has asked a question about expect average in the increase in salary post MBA. Um, so that question is a very, a very difficult one to answer, Danny, because everybody has an individual case, but I can direct you to the Financial Times um, rankings because they're probably the best source of information like on this. Those Financial Times rankings are organized by, um, by the Financial Times, obviously, but they reach out to the alumni and they ask that specific question. And so their data goes directly back to them and then they are reporting that data. So I think in general, you're looking at a 60% increase uh, in salary uh, three years post-graduation. And that's that's kind of the average of our programs. So feel free to take a look and we can answer more information about that, more questions about that if you have have them. Uh, and I can talk to specifically about your, uh, your, your specific um, uh, environment if you wanna have questions, if you wanna ask questions about the industry or something like that as well. <clears throat> so, I have another question here, but could you please share that slide on annual timetable? So, Joel, we, we will send that out to you. Uh, I think we can find a way to, to you know, direct you to that as well, instead of me flipping back to it, but we'll be sure that you get the information. Um, and then James has asked about GMAT scores. So I'll let Alex answer that question, but maybe what I will do is ask a question to Monica and Jeff uh, while we're waiting for more questions to come in. So Monica, I'm going to ask you first, what would you, you know, what advice would you give to somebody seeking out an executive MBA? Uh, thinking, looking back uh, at your time when you were probably comparing other programs, you know, you mentioned a five, you mentioned you started to think about it five years before the start date. And that is, is pretty common for executive MBA students. It, this is the course that I think people are always feeling like, um, it's never a great time to do an executive MBA because you're working full time. You've got your career that's going on. There's probably family situations happening, but eventually uh, people uh, rally around and, and get motivated to do it. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that process, Monica, like how it started five years ago uh, or five years before. And then, you know, I'm guessing it's probably two or three years of inaction, but back of the mind thinking, and then you probably came up with some criteria to decide which program was right for you. And that that information is really helpful for the people on the call today. So if you can provide that information, that would be great. Absolutely. Um, when I started to look at doing just the MBA, you know, I did really just think about what's around me locally. Um, so I did look at the schools here in Ottawa. Um, and then when I really got serious in like the last couple of years where I decided the MBA is um, more in line with what I do want to do. And it took me a little bit of time because I was thinking about some other programs as well. Um, but that entrepreneurial aspect was something that I wanted to strengthen. So for me, it just was obvious, but, but it, it took some time to get there. And then when I started to look at schools, it's an investment and I wanted to make a very good one. Um, I also wanted to go to a school that I also um, respected personally. So that was my choice um, to do the MBA at Queens and the executive piece was just almost like a, a bonus for me. It's something that I am, it translates much quicker. Um, it also is interesting because, you know, it, it's ideal for the person that is working, has been working. So it just really aligned. Um, and it, again, it, it's something that translates really well for me. That's great. Jeff, I'd like to ask you the same question. So how did you, you know, how did you come to this conclusion to do an executive MBA? And you know, what were your thought? What was your thought process of selecting the program? Yeah, very similar to Monica in that I started looking locally. Uh, being out in Vancouver, there's a few good choice schools here as well. Um, working full time and not really wanting to give up my career uh, to return for a full time MBA uh, and being in my early 30s at the time uh, was kind of in this part where it was I do a part time MBA 
or possibly you know stretch myself to an executive MBA where the average age tends to be a little bit older and I kind of decided that I didn't want to be the oldest person in the room and I wanted to learn from people um and so that put me into the executive MBA kind of uh headspace and then I started looking at programs to see like what would be available uh for me locally in Vancouver and some of the larger more schools that I respected, but at least what Monica was saying was, you know, Kellogg, U of T, you know, Western Ivy, and would, would require a lot of commuting back and forth, you know, almost two times a month or more. Uh, but this program came uh, available, it was available on weekends, you get two degrees, uh, and you do the majority of it in your local boardroom, with some travel planning that's very fixed at the start. So you can plan very easily for that. Um, I recommend anybody uh, to take a uh, uh, they have these uh, info sessions, uh, not like this webinar, but you can go and actually go see a demo and they'll do a mock class to see the tools, see what the environment's going to be like. And once I did that, it was I was pretty sold on the program uh, and the application advisors uh, were fantastic. And I had applied to a few other schools previously and the experience was just nowhere near what uh, Queens and Cornell offered. And so really rely on Alex as you're going through this process and you have these questions about GMAT or timelines, they are there to answer for you and the information will be accurate and correct. That's great. That's great. I see a few more questions coming in. So we have uh, uh, Shahir, oh no, uh, Farhan is a question. He's worked in IT cyber sales executive capacity for a large IT telecom company in Canada. I've worked with legal marketing, all divisions of a large organization, including the C-suite without having direct reports would I still qualify the, for the program? I think uh, Farhan, that's a that's a really good question. We need to to um, look a little bit into your resume and to ask you some specific questions. Um, but it sounds like if you've worked in project management capacities or you've been influencing people, then that would be potentially an option. So feel free to uh, reach out to our application advisor, and we can look at your situation specifically, and then we can discuss it. But it certainly sounds like you have a lot of experience, a wealth of experience, there that we can we can uh, look into. Can someone with less than 10 years of leadership experience working for provincial government be accepted into the program? Um, that's a that's a good question. I, I don't, I, the federal government or provincial governments doesn't matter to us. Uh, government employees are welcome to into the program. That's not a, that's not a concern. In fact, we have a number of governmental workers or NGO workers because of our locations in Ottawa and Edmonton and Toronto, as well as uh, Washington in the US as well. We have a number of people coming through that program. Um, less than 10 years is feasible, but it all just depends on how much less and kind of what is the quality of that experience. So again, I would really encourage you to reach out to Alex and have a conversation uh, around your particular your particular case, because it's hard to give kind of a specific answer for a, for a broad question like that. Um, we have some great questions now from Peter and Emily. So what is your average time commitment per week? And uh, I'm glad that this came up. So I'll, I'll start with Monica last time, but I'll come back to you at the end, Monica, and start with Jeff this time. Jeff, about how many hours uh, did you put into the program? And of course, the the other part of this question that wasn't that Peter didn't write, but Emily did, was how did you balance that? How did you manage to, to add those extra hours into your life with all of the other things that you have going on in your life? So let's start with you, Jeff. This is a great question. It's one that people ask me quite often about the MBA experience. Uh, the average time can be anywhere between 20 to 25 hours and sometimes more and sometimes less depending on the hotspots that you have. As far as balancing your work-life work balance, I don't actually like to think of it as work-life balance. I kind of think of it as a designed life. And so you find these time and periods, lunch hour to do things like webinars or calls to make meetings. So it's just about being efficient. There are Everyone's got these. Someone gave me this advice earlier, and I always say this you're going to have these balls up in the air. And it's going to be family, friends, work, school, other commitments, kids. Uh, you're going to drop them eventually uh, because there's so much going on. But don't drop the same one twice. So make sure that when you're going into this program, you have the full support and commitment of your, your family and partners, your kids, uh, your spouse your work everything that you have make sure that they're fully on board and understand what this might look like and recognize where your work is if you are working you know 10 hours on a paper and you know it's a 79 do you want to spend another three hours to get it to an 81 or an 82 sometimes someone said this done is good and uh, and get it in on time and so those are kind of the things that I like to to share with people as you're going through this because you're going to have another project, another one just down the road. Uh, 
Uh, and if you can get an hour with your family or friends, take it. That's great. Monica, how about you? How did you balance it? How many hours did you put into it every week? I want to echo exactly what Jeff just said. <laughs> um, I have to be honest. I think going into the program, I think I romanticized a lot and I put in a lot of time and then quickly learned to scale back. And like Jeff said, diminishing returns up at, at, at a certain point and you've got to figure that one out. You do have to preserve yourself. So that's, that's key. Um, you prioritize what's important. For me, again, it took me time. I really wanted to do well. So I put in a lot of time. Now, mind you, it was also during the pandemic. So I had time to and then it was, I, I did then lead, need to scale back and just be smart. What we know, work hard, work, work smarter. I'm gonna pick up on one of Jeff's comments about kind of engaging the people around you. Did you actively do that? Talk to your coworkers or your friends and family and just to communicate about what you were taking on? Absolutely. Um, my, my employer, my good colleagues and family were all very supportive of a small network and then the team and our team coach was really phenomenal. I'm really glad you mentioned that, Monica, because we mentioned it a couple of times about coaches, but we didn't really draw it out and explain it. We do have a, a coaching philosophy at Queen's and that includes a team coach. So you have a coach that will work with your team specifically on the dynamics of your team and about how to how to help that team become more productive and to become a high performing team. But we also have uh, career coaches so that you can connect with your career coach to talk about what your next steps are, what you want to do with your uh, career going forward, or even just reinventing kind of your your skill set and, and, and highlighting more specifically what you're what you're interested in working on. We have um, specific. Uh, executive coaches, which are a little bit different than a career coach. The career coach is thinking about your next job and about what your next role will be. But the executive coach can talk to you in a much deeper level. And all of that is confidential. We don't have any access to that. I will never know. Glory will never know what's discussed in those executive coaching um, calls. But I would encourage you to take advantage of that. It's very popular uh, for boards across uh, Canada, North America to have executive coaches to work with individuals. Because I think we all have um, you know, deficiencies and strengths that we that we probably are aware of. Uh, you know, one common one is people don't like to provide negative feedback or they don't like to have difficult conversation. And then people will, will spend, you know, large amounts of time trying to avoid having those conversations. But eventually, uh, you know, having those conversations can make the environment a much better scenario, a much better situation and, and you know, help the people around you. So I think that's an example of, of something that you can discuss with an executive coach who can really help you identify when you're starting to slip into a procrastination habit or you're starting to uh, do things to avoid uh, work and uh, uh, to avoid a specific challenge at work uh, and then help you come up with solutions and plans to actually tackle them head on and just to move on to the next role. Um, so I would encourage you to look into that. We also have something called Fit to Lead, which is focused more on the mental and the physical well-being of the students uh, in the program. And we would encourage you to participate in those activities. We do everything from stretching, yoga, uh, you know, there's daily, almost daily events for, um, for exercise, uh, as well as there's mental health um, uh, uh, practices as well. So things like resetting your expectations or how do you pick yourself up after a disappointing result? Um, there's also a really great one that's very popular is how to take a proper nap. So there is science behind this about how long a nap should be, about how you should how you should uh, jump into a, into a nap. And uh, those are all great extra pieces that are around the around the um, students as they go through the program. Um, so just going back to Emily for one more question is so what's the format of the courses? Are they case discussion? So I'm going to ask Monica and Jeff to talk about what uh, what you experienced in the course, but I can just say broadly speaking, there are cases, there are presentations, there's individual papers, there's quizzes, there's tests. Um, there's probably almost everything that you would expect uh, in an academic environment. Um, the, the good thing about this is we have so many professors in the program that you're going to be encountering all of their different types of assessment. So it could even be um, you know, debates that would be happening in courses for participation grades and so on. But I'll start with you, Monica, this time. Do you remember anything about the assignments that, that came through from the courses? Or there, do you have a typical memory of what an assignment would look like and how it would kind of come together? Uh, yes. 
So, well, the format of the courses, I would say, you know, it, it's very strategic. Things were lined a certain way. We, we were taught certain things that we would apply um, in later courses. And in some particular courses, there was a lot of case discussion, really interesting stuff, um, very relevant um, as well. And then the assignments um, really got us to test what we were learning, but to apply it to practical things. And that is something that I truly valued because I was able to see how I would use this in my sector as well as, you know, if I wanted to look at a business venture or look at um, consulting work. That's great. Does that and, answer the question? No, that's great, Monica. And, and you mentioned, you're always mentioning, both of you are mentioning great things that make me think about uh, comments that I want to make. So please continue to add those great comments. Consulting is an interesting an interesting um, uh, point that you've raised because many people who are thinking about increasing their compensation or advancing their careers, one thing that I've noticed of being associated with this program for uh, about five years is a number of our graduates go on to open up consulting side hustles. So they continue to work in their main career uh, where they take on contracts on the side and they do some work um, as a consultant on the side too. And so I raise that point because the, if compensation increases one of your motivations, there's more ways than, than, than what you would maybe typically expect, which would be a different career or a different position. There's also side hustles. There's also investments. I'm always surprised every year by how many real estate investors there are in these programs. And I'm sure that both Monica and Jeff have recognized people who are uh, purchasing and operating rental properties uh, in their cohort. But uh, again, that's another interesting piece of information that you can gain through your network. Uh, Jeff, were there any notable projects or assignments that that uh, we didn't mention that you that you remember? Yeah, there was a few that are stand out. One thing I think I'll flag because it wasn't quite as apparent to me when I was applying is that uh, any creditable uh, university running an MBA program, executive MBA program is going to have the exact same type of courses. You're going to have your finance, accounting, and they generally will move through uh, the same way, you, you know, piling on your knowledge for the next um, program. I would echo uh, what Monica was saying in that it's kind of a mix of case studies, a lot of general open discussion, and some of the things that are very quantitative are going to be, uh, you know, individual for the most part. Um, but that experience, again, is designed through the program, for the program, for the last, help me out, Charles, 15 years that this has been running or more. Um, so they, it's set up in a very, very way that you can digest every little part as you go. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And uh, maybe I'll take a time now to talk about the Global Business Project and the individual project as well. I briefly mentioned it earlier in relation to your career advancement. And again, just maybe highlighting that point as well. We have many people in the program who have specific skill sets. And in fact, I would say most of the executive MBA students are experts in their area. So they could be a sales and marketing expert. They could be an HR expert, could be an accountant. They could be a finance uh, professional. Uh, but what they're really thinking of, of the next stage of their career is how do they work across these kind of silos and across these functions uh, in a business. Um, and so the individual project is a really great way for you to go and to, to gain experience in a different area. And I, I can think very specifically of many engineers in the past uh, who have, have been in the program and probably both of you know engineers. And they've, they've specifically been interested in moving into strategy and trying to understand why are we uh, doing this um, you know, this project or why are we investing in this project? And I want, he want, that person wants to be more in determining uh, which projects to invest in. And so this is a great way for you to go and reach to a different area of your company or to reach outside of your company to a different company and pitch to them that you're going to be doing 130 hours of work uh, for this program for free. And if you would, if, uh, if it's available, you would love to do a consulting project for a company or a new venture project for a company. And it's a great way for you as an individual to demonstrate a skill set that maybe not maybe doesn't really come through on your resume right now because you're you're you know if you're an engineer people are thinking of you as an engineer uh, maybe not a strategist and so if you can get a, a 130 hour project on strategy into your portfolio experience this becomes a very powerful way to for you to leverage and discuss your your career ambitions with other companies and also within your own company um, but I'd like to ask, uh, uh, Mona, and then also there's one more, the Global Business Project, which is a team project where you travel abroad. So I'm going to ask Jeff about maybe your individual project and Monica about your your uh, Global Business Project, if that's okay. Yeah? Okay, so I'll start with Jeff. Do you remember your individual project and what did you do it on? 
Uh, I had to think about it for a minute because I the gl the global one uh, definitely stood out a bit more. Uh, it was more for mine. It was on uh, kind of cloud computing digital transformation, which was also one of the classes that we had uh, in helping to. Uh, it was my own organization to revolutionize the way that we were doing using uh, IT. So it was you know it was nice that I was able to couple that with my own work, and then down the road it paid dividends because uh, it made things a lot easier for me as well. <laughs> um, but it was, uh, yeah, th these ones are always very exciting. You can use a point of interest that you, you currently have and be able to apply some of the learnings that you've been getting um, throughout your, your, uh, your schooling and, uh, you know, show your employer and your boss that you've been, you, you know, you're, you're learning and you're doing good things. This is also another good, uh, a good point of your pitch to the company to sponsor you, to offer you some sponsorship as you can, you can recommend or tell them that you will use those hours for something company related to. Uh, Monica, how about your global business project? What did, how did that come together? I have to start by saying uh, the flip of Jeff, I think the individual assignment for me was, was definitely a bonus, but um, equally as good was our global business project. We were able to do some work for this company called Isorca in Iceland. So an EV uh, charging station company that was going through some important changes. Um, and that was really, really exciting. They were a company that were also vested in us. So, you know, really gave us their time, um, took us seriously. So it was, it was really good. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we weren't able to go there to do our pitch and presentation and, and really assess the, the business um, hands-on. But otherwise, we were, we, we were able to access information and it, it was a good project. That's great. Excellent. Well, I'm conscious of the time is running out uh, really quickly. So I'm going to just put one more question back to both of you, and it's going to be about advice. So uh, we'll, we'll start this time with you, Monica. Uh, Monica, if there were any advice you could give yourself when you were going through this process, what would you give? What advice would you give to yourself? Maybe even at the beginning of the program, what would you say to yourself? Uh, do not take yourself that seriously. Um, <laughs> I, I went into the program very much, you know, return on investment and, you know, almost having this imposter syndrome, you know, do I belong here and whatnot. Um, so my advice to people thinking about the program, um, do it, do it and, and don't just do it for the financial outcome. Um, that will come. The school carries a lot of weight. The degree does as well. Um, do it because it does build your character and it, it builds, um, yeah, clearly it, it builds your um, resume, but it, it offers a whole lot more and just personal learning and then just meeting some very good people along the way. That's amazing. I mean, there's, there are very few opportunities for people who are, you know, 35, 40, 45, 50 to actually have an opportunity to be surrounded by 100 like-minded people. Like, I can't think of any other scenario aside from doing an executive MBA where you can get so many people together with the same kind of motivation and goals and creating a really inclusive and safe space for you to share and help each other out. There's not a lot of opportunities to do that. And this is one that you can really, can really dive into. Jeff, how about you? What advice would you give to yourself? I would say the exact same thing. Give into the process. Uh, understand that you will not be the same person graduating that you are going in. It's very transformative in that way. Let your ego go. Uh, follow the tools that they give you and really just enjoy those moments. Make that time to connect with people like Monica did with those coffee chats outside. So you get to really uh, gain that strength of relationship that you're going to have carry on for the rest of your life take that time uh, as you go there and just recognize that they have a process they've been doing it for years the sooner you give into it as a group or individually the sooner your team will perform higher the more productive you'll be the easier the work will be uh, and you'll enjoy it that's great thank you both so much for joining the call today it was great to hear your insights and your experience i know that all the people on the call uh, are, have benefited from having the time to, to be with you. Uh, before I go, you know, we do like to support our alumni and Jeff, you know, general manager of Ethical Bean. Give me your two sentence pitch of Ethical Bean. 
Premium fair trade organic coffee roasted fresh in Vancouver, available at Sobeys for a bargain of $12. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Thank <you>. Charles. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.